from hip hop albums like Outkast's Atlians to Future's Pluto, or even songs like The Dream's Walking on the Moon or Ariana Grande's NASA, music artists have had a long time infatuation with outer space. But if there was ever one space related thing to celebrate, it would probably be this. On July 16, 1969, Apollo 11 took off on a mission to space to perform the first ever crewed lunar landing. The objective included scientific exploration, collection of lunar data, and the deployment of scientific equipment. On July 24, it returned to Earth, marking one of the greatest accomplishments in mankind's history. I'm here at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles for the Golden Moon Festival, marking the 50 year anniversary of this milestone achievement. It's time to get out of this world. Let me uh, begin by introducing myself. I'm Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory, and along with Dr. David Reitzel, Patrick So, Tony Cook, we are your All Space Considered team, are here the first Friday of every month to do the latest and greatest updates in astronomy and space science. Almost two weeks now, um, we've been devoted entirely to celebrating Apollo 11. One of our museum guides, John Palmer, who is in the audience, I believe, tonight, John, thank you, um, was responsible for helping us get those wonderful helmets. We had a helmet signed by Michael Collins, who was in the command module orbiting up there for Apollo 11. His signature even drew a little command module. Um, the other helmet was signed by Dave Scott, the seventh man on the moon, the first man on the moon to drive a car. So that's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, all those displays down there, it was a pleasure to put them together. They're still there. Tonight is the last night you can see them. Next to me, Jerry Elverum, and next to him, Don Harvey, both of whom were engineers who worked for TRW and developed the descent engine that landed uh, the lunar module on the moon. Now, most, most of the time when you have a rocket, you turn it on, you get a certain amount of thrust, or you turn it off. But they needed to have a throttling rocket, one that they could have turn up, turn back, and also a gimbling one, one that could turn so they could steer. So this flexibility in a rocket was not something that had ever been done before. You want to have absolute control of what the flow rate's going into your device is, because if you can't control that, it, if you let it control the flow rate, you're going to go any place. Since it's a cavitating venturi, which Don will talk about, there's no reason we can't throttle that with a pinto into the throat of the cavitating venturi. So how did he solve that problem? Let me show you that little 500 pound thrust engine. So it was a scaled down version, 500 SDL pounds. When Kennedy made his statement about going to the moon. And this engine here, the pinto you can see right there, there is the injector in the center of that engine. And here's a tip of it that's closed off and the oxidizer sprays out here, but it has a pintle that goes into the throat. And so it is closing the fuel and oxidizer down in flow rate. And that is now throttling this engine. And the two of them are tied together with a very simple mechanical sleeve. So for every position of this sleeve, there is a flow rate determined absolutely back here. This was a brand new innovation. You designed it? I designed it. So why go back to the moon? We go back to the moon to save our lives. We go back to the moon to do things, to do the things that will solve the critical problems that we are facing in the next 25 to 50 years. But we also go back to the moon because this opens the door to solving the problems that threaten to end, at a minimum, human civilization by the end of the century, if not the human race and most of the life on Earth entirely. From Apollo 11 launch to translunar orbit took only two hours and 44 minutes, less time than it would take to watch Belly and Fade in Full back to back. Trust me, I did the math. A little bit about the uh, 
Apollo guidance computer. This was a, a computer that controlled the whole descent. It's about the size of a carry-on suitcase, a little bit bigger, weighs about 70 uh, pounds. And um, it had, uh, by today's standards, not a lot of capacity. You can see that uh, 32, 36K of read-only memory, which contained all these programs for descent. And these were let, literally uh, ones and zeros uh, woven into wires that were inside the computer. So that's and K, not K, Meg, right, K. Right, and we don't even talk about Megs. Oh, yeah. uh, we talk about uh, gigabytes and even terabytes. So a million to a hundred million fold the capacity of uh, the computer back then. Now, this was the most advanced computer at the time and it did the job and it had to calculate from the landing radar, the altitude, the attitude, the orientation and space of the, of the lunar module and its velocity and then modulate how much uh, thrust was needed uh, to uh, attain that glide path down to the, uh, to the ground. Apart from the two astronauts actually visually witnessing the descent down, this was the only um, uh, film that we have of uh, what it would look like as uh, the lunar module um, descended down to the moon. So it's film, it was developed later, but we're, we're, we placed it in this next video side by side with a CBS simulation. You also want to, maybe I'll just mention, so, so as they're coming over, you'll see, uh, you'll hear Neil Armstrong take over because where they were going to land was a boulder field in a crater. So if they had left it to the computer, they would have landed in a, in a very dangerous spot, possibly tipped over the lander. Of course, then came the great historic moment that everyone knows. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the left foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. NASA made sure that uh, each astronaut had the whole, the kind of like a checklist of all the activities, all the things that they needed to do on the moon. And as mentioned earlier, they set up some uh, early uh, some scientific experiments. Uh, one of them was um, a, um, a device to measure solar wind. All it was was a big aluminium piece of foil and to capture pieces of the sun, and that was left uh, exposed to the sun for about 77 minutes, and then the the foil was retrieved and then taken back to Earth for analysis. Uh, the two other experiments was on the on the left there is a uh, seismometer used to uh, measure moonquakes and um, they did get confirmation that it worked on the day of the landing because uh, once they turned the instrument on uh, scientists back on Earth could actually hear the vibrations of the footprints of the astronauts as they, as they tromped across the moon. So it was really kind of great and they even heard uh, movement from within the uh, lunar module. That's how sensitive this uh, seismometer was. On the right is a lunar reflector uh, designed to uh, reflect a powerful laser beam sent from an observatory from the Earth. Reflected off that uh, uh, mirrored, uh, it's actually a, a, an array of mirrors, and the light that's bounced back uh, to, to Earth is, um, the, if they can get the timing of it, uh, the round trip and just half of that timing, and they know the speed of light, they can cal calculate the actual um, Earth-Moon distance to within a few inches. And these reflectors uh, left by Apollo 11 and, and the other missions are still in use today. The Moon was formed in a giant <coughs> impact. This uh, Robin Kenop did this wonderful numerical model. You can see an object hit the Earth, kind of turned it into this glubby blob of hot stuff. That's, that's our Earth, about uh, 4.5. 
four million uh, billion years ago. And then as this material uh, spirals around, it forms a disk. So the Earth actually had rings for a very short while, maybe as short as even a year, maybe as long as about a hundred years. But very quickly, there we go, this tidal stretched out more material into this disk. And then that material coalesced into the moon we see today. A May back then sounds pretty roomy, right? Imagine spending eight days inside one. That's right, the command module that the Apollo 11 crew spent all that time in on the first lunar landing was the size of a large car. How's that for Maybach music? And the descent was like this. So the uh, top part, uh, that conical part, which is a command module, separated from the rest of the service module. And the uh, surf uh, command module re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere in a blazing fireball. Um, the heat shield experienced 4,000 degrees um, Fahrenheit temperature, and then eventually the parachutes deployed and they splashed down into the ocean. So that was 50 years ago today. There's a neat story I saw from a friend of ours, another astronomer, Katie Mack, who's called into us on Skype that her grandfather played a role in this. He was analyzing spy satellite images, noticed there was a storm right where they had originally planned to come in, contacted NASA and said, you need to change where Apollo 11's coming in, and you just have to trust me. I can't tell you how I know, but you need to move it, and they did. <laughs> You'd think you just came back from this trip and all you wanna do is breathe the beautiful fresh air of Earth and hug your wife, but no. They had to go back into a different tin can. Yeah, 21 days of isolation, quarantine. Um, they were worried about lunar bugs, essentially little microbes that maybe somehow could survive in the dirt or dust and make people sick. So into the trailer where they communicated with the president through the you know window there and talked to him. They talked to their wives through the window. They were in Hawaii, by the way. That's why they have the beautiful flowers. Um, they actually had to go through customs. So this is a real customs form here that, if you look closely, departure from the moon, arrival, Honolulu, Hawaii. So yeah, they took it seriously. If you look in there, they also had to document moon rock and moon dust samples were their cargo they brought in. For all of you who participated in this, and some of you who came back multiple times, thank you so much. We not only felt we wanted to bring the Apollo 11 astronauts all the way home, I know a lot of celebrations ended over the weekend, we wanted to bring them home safely. Um, but we're also going to be celebrating all the future missions. We look forward to having you join us and thank you again, all of you, for coming tonight. And that's an official wrap here at the Griffith Observatory's Golden Moon Festival. 50 years since this historic mission, so much has changed. We know more about space than we ever did before. Billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk have set in motion plans for individual space exploration. Even people like Mike Pence have plans for a space force in just five years. Whatever the case, in the next 50 years, when we celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the first ever lunar landing, chances are your favorite futuristic rapper will probably be spitting bars from Mars. I'm the Hip Hop MD, this is Hip Hop Science, we are off to our next Space Force mission. God, that name is goddamn Space Force anyway.